Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's stand and greet one another in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank Good morning. you. Good morning. Good morning. It is uh, great to see everyone here today. As you make your way back to your pew, take this time to sign our friendship pads, which are located at the end of each pew, so that we can have a record of who was here. Uh, a lot continues to go on in the life of the church. So much is in our bulletin. Uh, so go ahead and read through that. But let me highlight a few things. First and foremost, our Christmas concert is tonight. If you've been before, you know how amazing it is. Uh, so amazing. We want you to invite your family, your friends, and your neighbors to come and be part of this. Uh, the doors will open at 5.30. If you come at 5.20, you'll be outside. The doors will open at 5.30. The concert's at 6. It's going to be great. Remember, I told you this is the most relaxed Christmas concert you'll ever experience, and you will not want to miss it. Uh, this Tuesday at 6.30, our new ruling elders elected by the congregation are going to be examined by the session. Uh, we are inviting all ruling elders in the College of Elders to come and participate if they so desire. And besides all that, read your bulletin. And we have one other special announcement uh, or presentation, really. Yeah, Meredith, everyone. Good morning. So everyone knows Miss Gracie. Miss Gracie lives here, basically, <laughs> don't you, in every capacity. Um, two years ago, we were given the opportunity to have a children's ministry intern. And the first name that popped in both Dr. Hinkle's head and my head was Gracie. Of course, everybody loved Gracie. She has given us two years of her time, and we are reluctantly letting her leave us. <laughs> But the good news is she's a part of our family. She will never truly be gone. She will always be here, and we will always love her. And we just wanted to thank her for her time for the past two, the very fast past two years. So thank you. Thank you, Gracie. Now let's prepare our hearts, our minds, and our souls for worship. John the Baptist proclaimed, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And the two people went out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And John said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. We light the first Advent candle to remind us to keep awake and be ready. We light the second Advent candle to remind us to change our ways. Heavenly Father, as we light this Advent candle, we turn our hearts to the message of John the Baptist. May we prepare the way for the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, in our lives. Help us to repent, turn from our shortcomings, and make our paths straight. Fill us with anticipation, hope, and the joy of our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning. Let us worship the Lord. We come together now to a time of confession, invited into these prayers by God who knows us better than we know ourselves. God who knows over this past week we have failed to love God with our whole hearts. We have failed to love our neighbor as ourselves. Certain things we've held back. And so God invites us to unburden ourselves of the guilt and the shame of our sin together as the body of Christ and in the silence of our hearts. But remember, we confess our sin not hoping that God will forgive us for these things. We confess knowing that through Jesus Christ we've been forgiven and God's grace is for us. And so, anxious to be reminded of that good news, let us pray our prayers of confession. Gracious God, your perspective is eternal. Our view is narrow and clouded with bias. You are present to all. We overlook the people and circumstances right in front of us. You are orchestrating all of history toward fullness in Jesus. We struggle to maintain healthy relationships even with those we love most. Father, we need you, your perspective, your presence, and your power. Forgive us for turning to our own broken wisdom and limited perspectives. Direct us more fully to your Son. Make us more like him and empower us by your Spirit to follow the way of Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name.
My friends, listen to the good news of the gospel. Scripture tells us that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what your journey, remember, you are known and loved by the God that made you, and it is through this God's only son, Jesus Christ, we have been forgiven. This is the gospel, and so believe it and rejoice. Amen. Please be seated. Would the children please come forward and meet me up front for time with the young church. We're going to come, we're going to sit, we're going to cram in right here. Right here. It occurred to me that we should have asked great Miss Gracie to do time with the young church today, being her last Sunday as an employee and all. Oh, well. Here, come scoot this way. You guys need to get close because I've got something I need you to see. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone? Good. So, so good to see you. Um, I hope you're all doing wonderful. You look very Christmassy. I can feel the Christmas joy just seeping out of your pores as we sit. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be together. Listen, I brought something to show you. This is a book called All Creation Waits. We have a version of this book we've had for years. We know this, the woman who wrote this, Gail Boss, and she just came out with this children's book version. Uh, the, I love this story. I love the stories that this book tells. And let me tell you something. We are in the season of Advent, right? We are preparing and getting ready for what? Jesus' birth. Jesus' birth. And also getting ready for when Jesus will come again, because Jesus promises he'll come again. Um, this book tells us stories about animals in nature that are also getting ready. Pop quiz. In the wintertime, are days shorter or longer than in the summer? Shorter, right? Good. Some of you raise your hand. Some of you, the, the homeschoolers, just shout them out. Uh, but the, yes, that's right. You were going to say shorter too, right, guys? Yeah, they're shorter. The days are shorter, and they're, pop quiz, colder or warmer? Colder. 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 Thank you, Sam, for raising your hand. <laughs> uh, that's right. And so when this weather change happens, animals have to start getting ready. If you lived outside in the woods, you would do the same thing. The, do the days get shorter, the days get colder, and animals have to plan and prepare to make it through the long cold winter for when the days start to get longer again and the warm light comes back. And that's springtime, right? Let me read you one story about an animal that does just that. And it's fun to imagine. As we're in Advent, we're preparing, we're getting ready for Jesus to come. We're getting ready, we're preparing, and we're waiting, right? We're waiting. Listen to this. Under a full moon, a stone. No, it's cottontail. Quiet. Still, until owl hoots. By the way, do you know what owls do to cottontails? Eat them, yes. Yes. Then, like a lightning bolt, cottontail dashes the zigzag path she made for escape to her brush pile. See that path she made in the snow? She hides through the next day, warming herself till night comes, and then again, she must go out to eat. At night... Most hunters sleep. To others, she's invisible, but owl sees. So before she nibbles twig tips, she hops her paths, packing down snow, making them hard and fast. Loose snow slows down her zigzag bolts. She packs three paths, then settles down to eat, quiet, still, and ready to leap. That's the 
Cottontail's story. Isn't that pretty cool how the Cottontail rabbit, before she goes out hunting, smashes down little paths in the snow so that she can be faster if the owl comes to try to get her? Isn't that kind of neat how she gets ready? It is neat, isn't it? Uh, we are also getting ready and we are waiting. Uh, and I think it's really, really special that there are stories that come out of God's creation that help us to understand just that. So let's pray together. Are you guys coming to the Christmas concert tonight, I hope? Yes. Pretty fun. I know you are. No. Looking forward no. to that. Yes, you are. You all are. No. Bow your heads. No. Put your hands together. Repeat this prayer with me. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this day. Help us. Help us. As we prepare. As we prepare for the coming of Jesus Christ. The coming of Jesus Christ. You love us. You love us. We love you. We love you. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening, my friends. Let us pray together. Gracious God, as we turn to your word for us, may your Holy Spirit rest upon us. Help us to be steadfast in our hearing, in our speaking, in our believing, and in our living. Amen. Today's Psalm is Psalm 85. Lord, you were favorable to your land you restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin, Selah. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God, of our salvation and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. The word of the Lord.
This morning's gospel lesson comes to us from Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. I invite you to open up your Bibles, or the Bibles provided for you, as we listen to God's holy word once more. Now here are the words of our Lord. In the 15th year in the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and during the high priesthood of Ananias and Sapphira, the word of God came to John of Zechariah in the desert. He went into the countryside in the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. As it is written from the book of the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him, for every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked path will be made straight, the rough road made smooth, and all of mankind will see God's salvation. And John preached to the crowd, coming out to be baptized. You brood of vipers, who warned you about the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not begin to say to yourself, but we are children of Abraham. For I tell you, if God wanted to, he could make these stones into Abraham's children. Look and see, the axe is already at the root. Every tree that does not produce fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What shall we do then, the crowd asked. John said, the man with two coats should share with him who has none, and the one who has food should do the same. The tax collectors who came to be baptized te said, Teacher, what should we do? Do not collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked them, What shall we do? And John said, Do not extort money, and do not accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ, the Messiah. And John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am unworthy to tie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chafe and quench an unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John preached to the people, and he declared the good news to them. My friends, these are the words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh, Heavenly Father and gracious God, we truly give you thanks for this day for the opportunity to gather together as the body of Christ and to seek your will for our lives. And as we gather in this room made sacred not by our presence, but by the presence of your Holy Spirit, we pray that your Spirit would move us, that it would shake us, that it would transform us. So open up our minds so that we may feel your love. Open up our hearts so that we can understand your work in this world. And now, Lord, may the words from my mouth, the meditations from our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. O oh, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was in college, to make a little extra money, I worked for this landscaping business. The landscaping business was owned by a, a real estate agent in Clinton, South Carolina. He had graduated from Presbyterian College. He was a Sigma Nu, so he hired other Sigma Nu brothers. I loved the job, it put some money in my pocket. The hours were just perfect. When I got off from class on Thursday, I would go to work. When I got off from class on Friday, I would go to work. And if, if it wasn't raining, I could work all day Saturday in the morning and in the afternoon. 
And I worked because while my parents were gracious and kind enough to pay my bills at Presbyterian College, if I wanted a little extra money to go out on a date, that was on me. The only problem with working for this landscaping business is that I had to work next to Preacher Mike. Preacher Mike was really the only full-time employee and it was his job to oversee us college boys, as he would call us. Now, when I first met Preacher Mike, I could have sworn that he was 50. I later learned he was only 39, which kind of showed you the life he lived. Until one morning, when he woke up, and he wanted more than what this world had to offer. He wanted Jesus. And according to Preacher Mike, he got saved. And getting saved, he got baptized. And in getting baptized, he walked the straight and narrow. And Preacher Mike thought it was his divine calling to save us college boys from the debauchery that we were living. Now to the younger generation, we didn't have earbuds. Couldn't put those in and drown them out. And as I made it very clear, I was poor and I couldn't afford a Sony Walkman. Do you remember Sony Walkman? I didn't have one. And for some reason, I always pulled the short straw and I had to work exactly next to Preacher Mike, who preached to me every time. Now, I will let you know, Preacher Mike, in my, in my life, is probably one of the most influential ministers I've ever heard preached. Because I have never forgotten one of his sermons. Now, here it is. He only had one sermon. It was three points. In a conclusion, point number one, we college boys are a bunch of cowards. We're such cowards that we have to drink a lot of can and courage just to kiss a girl. Now, if you don't know what a can of courage is, talk to me after the benediction. Point number two. Kissing girls wasn't the only thing we were thinking of. And point number three. You take point number one, you combine it with point number two, and you boys are going straight to hell. <laughs> that was a sermon. His only sermon. And I'll be honest with you, somewhere in point number three, I just drowned Mike out. And I wish I had, especially back then. But it's because his conclusion was totally different. In spite of point one, in spite of point two, in spite of going to hell, Mike said his prayer for us college boys said so one day we would wake up and we too would want Jesus. And in wanting Jesus, we would find out that Jesus has always, always wanted us. Last Sunday we introduced our series of sermons which is hearing the voices of Advent those voices that first proclaim the coming of the Messiah. On our, our first Sunday, we looked at the prophet Isaiah who spoke about how God's world will one day break through the real world. He said, out of the stump of Jesse will come a shoot, will come a tree. What Isaiah was saying is that out of something dead will come new life. On the second Sunday of Advent, the voice we're going to listen to is that of John the Baptist. 
For some, John the Baptist isn't necessarily the voice you think of when you think of Advent, when you think of the coming of the Messiah, but he plays such a pivotal role in the birth narrative, especially in the Gospel of Luke. We're told that when Mary discovers that she is with child, she has to leave her home and go and live with her cousin Elizabeth and her husband Zechariah. And Luke tells us that Elizabeth is also with child, and this is a miracle. Because Luke is clear. Elizabeth, she's old, and everybody thought she was barren. And Luke says, as Mary and Elizabeth see each other, that baby in Elizabeth's womb leaped for joy. And that baby, when it's born, will be a boy. And that boy will be named John. And when John becomes a man, he will baptize sinners in the Jordan. And the next time we hear of John, both John and Jesus are grown men. Jesus is just starting his ministry. However, John's ministry has been going on for a while, and his ministry has created a stir, especially in Jerusalem, among the religious elite and people in positions of political power. The truth is, John's sermons, much like what we observed from Isaiah in the Old Testament, would make, well, it would make all of us uncomfortable. And maybe this is why Luke, in his introduction of John, connects Isaiah with this wild-eyed, wild-haired prophet baptizing people in the Jordan. Luke actually quotes Isaiah to connect the two. A voice, a one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his path. And in the wilderness, John preaches. You brood of vipers, who warned you about the coming wrath? And do not sit there and say to me, but we are children of Abraham, for I tell you, if God wanted to, he could turn these stones into Abraham's children. Look. Look. The axe is already at the root. Trees that produce fruit will be spared, but those that don't will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And I love it because Luke says, this is good news. Now sometimes, when I read the Bible, when we read the Bible, what we read sounds just familiar to us because we've read it again and again and again. And sometimes, I caution you, it is too familiar. For example, take the word brood. John called the people listening to his sermon, you brood of vipers. I cannot tell you, in the 56 years I have walked this earth, that I really ever gave the word brood much thought. I can't tell you in my 29 years of ministry how many times I have preached from the Gospel of Luke, the third chapter, and I've read to people just like you, sitting in pews, just like these, the word brood of vipers. Now, I always thought the brood somehow meant to be connected to, to, to be linked to. But uh, the truth is, I really just did not have a good definition to go by until, of course, this week I kind of looked it up and did a word study and looked at the Greek. And the word that's used for brood in the Greek, it's more than just connect. 
It's more than just linked. It means offspring. It means children. You children of snakes and vipers. For those who were listening to John, waiting to be baptized, he was making it so very clear who you are, where you're from, what you do for a living, what church you belong to. If you go to church, it will not save you. And this is a problem for the Jewish people who were listening to John because they were always taught from the beginning their salvation was inherited. It was their birthright. But John is making it clear who your daddy is is not going to save you. For only salvation produces fruit. And according to John, fruit, which is life, that life can only come and can only happen when we are repentant. Remember preacher Mike's conclusion to his sermon? And no, it wasn't about beer and girls and a quick way to hell. Instead, he prayed that us college boys would, would want Jesus in our lives. I'm not, I'm not even really sure why this week I started thinking about Preacher Mike as I prepared for this sermon some 35 years later. But I'm glad I did because in, in remembering... It was made clear to me that I saw Mike in the same way those religious elites and people in power saw John the Baptist. You know, you really don't mind his preaching as long as he's not preaching to me. Because when he starts preaching to me, he's gone from preaching to meddling. And who really wants to hear a sermon about repentance? To hear that somehow we are less than perfect less than holy. And even when we recognize we're not good enough, we compare ourselves to other people because we think they're way worse than we are, only to discover we're all the same. But repentance means I can't do this by myself. Repentance means I can't save myself. Repentance means I cannot heal myself. Repentance means I cannot truly be myself, which i got to be honest with you, is not really something the world wants to hear. Better yet, John, like preacher Mike, was not calling us to repent for the sake of repentance like it was some ritual or liturgy if we would just go through the motions in order for us to check it off our list in order just to feel good about ourselves. Preacher Mike was not saved because somehow he read about salvation in a book. Preacher Mike was not saved because of who he voted for or his opinions about geopolitics. Preacher Mike was saved because one morning he woke up and he was tired. He was just bone tired. And he wanted more. He wanted Jesus. This 
is when we are moved to repentance. True repentance. When we, much like preacher Mike, we want Jesus more than we want this world. When we want the one who came to set us free. When we want the one who offers us grace and mercy with no strings attached. When we want the one who says to us, come out these doors and follow me into this world. And in wanting him, we will always seek the one born in Bethlehem. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, so be it. Amen. My dear friends, like the saints have gone before us, let us stand and confess what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for your promises for the future and for your activity in the past and in the present. Because of what you've done, we can trust what you are doing and what you will do. And you have revealed yourself in the astounding wonder of the universe. You've spoken to your people through the powerful words of prophets, the extraordinary deeds of ordinary men and women. You lived among us as the promised Messiah and gave yourself for the reconciliation of the world. There is none other who can save. Our hope is in you alone. Our faith is built on your great promises of the new heaven and new earth, confirmed in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And so God, continue to remind us and challenge us and disturb us and comfort us by the promise that the one who has come will come again. Give us a keen anticipation of your kingdom. Give us patience in our longing and our waiting and wisdom and faithfulness as we seek to serve you. God, there is such terrible sorrow and strife among the human family. We mistrust one another. We exploit one another. We bear false witness. We enact violence. We bring suffering on others and ourselves and sometimes do so unknowingly. Lord, help us. Save us from ourselves. Never let us trivialize suffering of any type. Convince us of the futility of violence. Through your Holy Spirit, change our entrenched selfish values to those taught by Jesus. And remind us that your will for heaven is also your will for earth. Give peace in our hearts and souls, peace in places where battles rage and innocent people die, peace where there is hunger. God, we do continue to pray for those who were affected by the storms and tornadoes here in Middle Tennessee last night, places where there was loss of life and loss of property. Pray for churches and relief workers, everyone who's working to lend a hand, caring for those who are either grieving the loss of loved ones or their things, Lord, help them. We continue to pray for the preservation of life and an end to the ongoing conflict in Gaza and Ukraine parts of the world are being torn apart. Have mercy on us, God. Give us your peace. God, one more time, we thank you for the message of Advent and with its word of hope in the midst of our sorrow and our anger and our conflict. Advent with its assurance that life matters and its vision that many people are touched by your spirit and care deeply for your world. Most of all, we are inexpressibly grateful for the blessed promise that the future is in your hands and will be made perfect and complete according to your great promises. Our prayers are offered in the name of Jesus the Messiah, who is your Son, and who taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, let us continue in our worship now by giving our tithes and offerings to God.
Heavenly Father and gracious God, on this day of all days we give you thanks, for we recognize that you have given us the greatest blessing of all, the love and grace and mercy of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we have received his gift, let us go forth in this world and proclaim the good news for him, that in Jesus Christ there's life and life eternal. For it is in his holy name we pray. Amen.
Mother's Day weekend in 1990 in Clinton, South Carolina. I, along with the rest of those college boys, graduated there at our graduation was Preacher Mike. I've got to think and I've got to believe that every time he put his head on his pillow, his prayer, much like our prayer in this season of Advent, was the same. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Peace.